Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm super excited tonight because I have my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Norman Klein. Um, Norman um, is a seasoned forensic psychologist and has been in many, many courtrooms um, giving his expert opinion about those specific cases that are that he's been able to handle. Um, he's also a therapist. Um, we ha we are. I'm fortunate enough to uh, be a a neighbor in the building. And so there's a lot of times we've been able to collaborate and talk about different cases and different theories and what's going on in, um, in the divorce world and couples and, and whatnot. So I thought Norman would be a great fit um, to be able to share with us his experience um, about what it's really like in divorce uh, court, in family court. Um, many of us never see the inside of that world, which is, can be a good thing, um, but there are people who do see the inside of it. And I think, um, you know, maybe it'll be beneficial for those contemplating divorce or in it. And um, so Norman, I welcome you. Thank you so much for, for coming tonight. And um, I'm gonna turn the time over to you to, to speak with us for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we will take any questions um, that anybody has. If you could just, you know, give a raise of hand on um, using your Zoom and um, we'll be able to address anything that's, um, that you're thinking and it's on your mind. So go ahead, Norman, thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen, thank you for inviting me. And John, thank you also. Um, I'm Norman Klein, uh, PhD. Um, I'm board certified clinical psychologist and a board certified forensic psychologist. Um, I've been in practice since uh, <laughs> 1980. Um, and I, uh, well, let me, let me clarify what forensic means. I mean, a lot of people are confused about that because they, um, uh, you know, they, they watch TV and CSI and forensic, uh, uh, they confuse it. Forensic is just an adjective. Um, and it means, uh, it comes from the Latin uh, forensis over pertaining to courtrooms. So there could be a forensic anything. So a forensic entomologist, a forensic meteorologist, a forensic bricklayer, uh, if, it could, if, if that person as an expert can advise uh, the trier of fact in a courtroom. So what does a forensic psychologist do? Um, well, um, in, civil, in, in criminal court, the meat and potatoes of a forensic psychologist is advising the court on competency to stand trial mostly. Uh, 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 popularly, people think about, in, you know, the insanity plea, but that's very rare. Um, in um, civil court, it's almost always, oh, in criminal court, um, two things. Uh, a person's freedom is at stake, and the standard of proof is um, a reasonable doubt. That's a very high threshold. In civil court, the standard of proof is preponderance, which is a low threshold of 51, 49%. And what's at stake is people's money. Well, what does a psychologist do in civil court, briefly? Um, uh, it's got to do with uh, malpractice, mostly. Or, for example, um, 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 <clears throat> You go into an elevator, the elevator falls three floors, um, you claim post-traumatic stress disorder, you can't go back to work, you can't walk in, work in an office building, you sue everybody in sight. Well, was there a pre-existing condition? Are you malingering? That sort of thing. In family court, which is what we're all convened here to talk about, the standard of proof is clear and convincing evidence. I have no idea what that means. The, only the trier of fact, which is in a family court, almost always a judge, not a jury. Um, but then there needs to be persuasion. So in the real world, um, what a forensic psychologist does in a family court, divorce court, is to... Um, examine principles the principals in a case come to an opinion, defend their opinion persuasively. Why? Because truth in a courtroom is adversarial. Um, so you're going to get one side that says black and another side that says white. And who's going to who's going to prevail? The one who's most persuasive. 
And so in, a, in family court, it's about persuasion. Um, here's rule number one. And listen, I don't know if you're tuned in here because you're a parent or you're involved in divorce or you're a therapist or whatever it is. Here's rule number one. Never, ever go to court if you don't have to. Because court is warfare. It's ugly business and family court, and I'll get into this a little down the road, is the ugliest business of all. Um, now, in divorce, you don't have a choice. Ultimately, you do have to go to court. So what is the most opportune way to proceed? The best thing to do is an uncontested divorce where each party gets together and says, fuck you, fuck you, I want a divorce. Um, well, let's agree and bring it to the court. And then the court gives its imprimatur and you're out. I mean, you, that's doable. Um, that's also unusual because when it comes to divorce, I don't have to tell any of you probably that it is contentious, it is hateful, it is angry, it is ugly, it's emotional, and people want to get even. The parties want to get even. And so it's very unusual for it to be uncontested. So what's the next best thing? And this is really the meat and potatoes of your profession, Colleen. And Colleen does this and knows people who do this. And that's a mediated settlement. What does that mean? Well, if you don't want to go to court because court is warfare and it's adversarial, it's and and it's and it's not um, 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 agreeable enough to be uncontested, the next best thing is you go to a mediator. That can be an attorney, it can be a, a psychiatric social worker, it can be anyone who has a credential or experience mediating so that the people, the parties, the two parties come together to agree on all that is possible to agree on. And, and Colleen, maybe, uh, John, you, you can field some questions about this because that's not my bailiwick, but um, um, the, the idea is to bring to the court, bring to the, all the, the attorneys involved who will do your bidding in court uh, as um, comprehensive an agreement as you can agree upon so that what's left to uh, litigate is minimal. Now you see, <laughs> divorce is expensive. The next um, stratum is a contested divorce where each gets their own matrimonial attorney. They give them um, tens of thousands of dollars as retainer and they f fight tooth and nail, duke it out in court. And these, these attorneys typically get, I don't know, 500 to $900 an hour. So you all do the math. The carcass of the um, 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 marriage estate is picked clean by the time these things um, go to court and get finally adjudicated. And by the way, and I'm going to get into this because the, 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 the most important element here uh, has to do with custody, and I'm going to get to that. If children aren't involved, even a contested divorce is ugly, but there's a beginning, middle, and end to that. The forensic psychologist is called into court, not for any of the above, is called into court when questions of custody are challenged. When one parent wants custody uh, against another parent, and then the court is charged with um, fundamentally profound questions about parental fitness, and best interest of the child. So um, this is a very fraught uh, state of affairs. People come to me, this is an aside. People come to me, I, I've been doing this now a lot of years, clinically, I see patients, forensically, I go to court. Norman, Dr. Klein, um, 
how do you immerse yourself every day in people's suffering and go home at night and not be uh, depressed? Well, it took many years, but I've learned how to compartmentalize what I, um, um, what I experience clinically with my patients each day. My job is to listen and to empathize. You can't fake empathy. You literally have to put yourself in another person's shoes. And it can be very draining in real time. So the compartmentalization has to do with um, letting that go when you go home. The one way I have been unsuccessful in compartmentalizing and not being troubled when I go home has to do with custody. Evaluate custody issues where children are used as pawns and fodder between two parents who are so hateful that they're using their children to wound the other parent because that's i don't know you people and why you're here and whether that has to whether you're here because you're immersed in this stuff but every divorce is ugly some are uglier than others, but when you're in it, it's the ugliest thing ever. When it comes to child custody stuff, that is profoundly wounding and long-standing damage to a child. Um, so there's two things at play here. There's the empathy I talked about, but when it gets to the role of the forensic psychologist in a court of law, court is theater. Court is about winning. Court is about persuasion. If you reduce the clinical work to one word, it's empathy. If you reduce the forensic work to one word, it's persuasion. Because in a court of law, everybody's, the truth is adversarial. In a court of law, you can have the same set of facts um, two different days and have two different decisions by the trier of fact. In science, behavioral science, clinical work, not so much. It, the truth is immutable. I mean, um, there's only one truth. Um, so child custody evaluations are very, very expensive. Um, the judge is looking for all the evidence that has to do with, well, let me back up. What is a child custody evaluation? If I'm charged with doing a child custody evaluation and I don't do them, my, <laughs> my strength is, is criticizing custody evaluations because there's no such thing as a perfect custody evaluation. It's impossible to do a perfect custody evaluation. You are charged with examining, the court assigns the forensic psychologist um, to examine the principles, the children, the parents and the collaterals. Uh, I have the power to question pediatricians, police, teachers, nannies, neighbors, family. Why? All in the service of painting a picture that um, allows me to make a judgment about fitness, about um, to advise the court who's the ultimate decider, the judge is the ultimate decider, about um, custody. And I'll get into the various types of custody soon. So what does that involve? It involves a clinical examination, which is talking to somebody. It involves psychological testing over time. And there are myriad um, types of psychological tests that can get at parental fitness, get at, psychopath I mean, get at uh, psychopathology, you know, is this guy crazy? And in, in what way are they crazy? And to what degree are they crazy? Um, um, is the person lying? That sort of thing. Um, so there's the clinical, there's the psychometric, and most importantly, there is the naturalistic observation. I'm entitled to witness the parenting skills of the parents, each separately and together with the child. And the report I make and the opinion I draw, you need to know can only be subjective. There's nothing objective about that. The courts will, um, will be looking for, and this is the sine qua non, this is the ultimate doctrine standard 
in family court when it comes to custody, and that is best interest of the child. What the fuck does that mean? Nobody knows. Best interest of the child um, often, and this is what the research points out, by the way, is what is really the least detrimental alternative. Because if it's come to the attention of the court, it's already a messed up situation. The court has no interest in a, in, in a divorce where, you know, everybody is adequately performing and everybody's healthy and um, there are no clashes. Um, the court's only interested when things get combative and argumentative and adversarial. And then their standard is best interest of the child. And there's, that's a very vague um, lofty um, and idealized standard. It's way more realistic and objective to try to seek out the least detrimental alternative. The law hasn't caught up with that. We behavioral scientists um, understand that that really is um, what we ought to be um, addressing and trying to uh, excavate, trying to uncover. Okay, so. Um, ultimately, after months of what can be months of evaluation, we give birth to a report um, identifying the assets and deficits of each parent um, and their fitness and uh, all for the sake of the guiding the judge on determining a parental plan. So what is a parental plan? Um, Percentage of, well, let's get into the custody arrangements. There are different kinds of custody. There's sole custody, where one parent is determined to be the one who has all the rights and responsibilities for the child or children. Um, that's unusual, and it usually pivots on uh, one parent really being, really manifesting serious deficits criminal history, um, unemployment, um, substance abuse, that sort of thing. Much more common is joint custody. What's joint custody? That's where each parent um, um, has um, equal rights and equal responsibility. Um, and the interaction between parent and child is balanced. Now that is fraught with its own problems because that requires each parent to continue ongoing contact, to negotiate in real time what's best for their children. And so that is fraught with um, um, uh, keeping alive the animosities because they, they are required to be involved with each other. Um, there's divided custody where each parent gets a child or children a percentage of the time in each home. That's really messed up. It happens um, because, what is that, divided custody? Each has full responsibility and rights for X percent of time, usually 50-50 in the year. It's very confusing, very unstable, and there's the child is able to develop no permanent attachments. And finally, there's split custody. If there are more than one child, one parent gets one child, the other parent gets the other child. That obviously has an impact on each child that's incalculable, uh, and um, one makes a judgment about that on a case-to-case -case, um, uh, basis. Um, let me see. Um, you know, <laughs> my problem here was to reduce, uh, I, I teach this stuff, I teach psychology and the law, and this is like a three hour lecture for me, and I've had to reduce it to this. So I'm gonna ask you, I guess my time is up, I'm gonna ask you, it's best if, if you have some questions, I'm happy to fill in the gaps, and I could tell you about the history of this stuff and the philosophy, but um, uh, let me stop there and in, invite you to uh, pick my brain. Well, nice job, Norman, thank you thank so you. much. Like we, you could, we could go on and on with this stuff because it, there's so much that goes on in family court. And I think you laid it out nicely with, you know, from people 
going to court themselves, pro se, through mediation, collaborative divorce, and then litigation, which is the ultimate, you really don't want to go down that road, which is what also, you're I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. You never yeah. also want to act pro se in a court of law. I don't care if you're charged with jaywalking. You don't go to court without an attorney. Right. Go ahead. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, but I think one of the things about mediation is that people have more control over the outcomes financially, um, with their children, which is the utmost important thing, and around time, like the, the time that, you know, parents want to, or to be able to be with their children and being able to, you want to be able to work out that plan yourself instead of having a court decide Agreed. for you. Absolutely. Right. So with that kind of wrapping, I, I, does anyone have any questions for, for Dr. Klein? You could raise your hands virtually or if you click on the participants, there's a, a way you can raise your hand. Eric. Yeah. I'll start the volley. Um, I wanted to know how you felt about equal time parenting in terms of forensic psychology. Do you feel that that is uh, in the best interest for the child if you've got two mostly stable parents, even though they might dislike each other a great deal, do you find that equal time is a, is a good way to start? That's a great question, and I think all things being equal, all things being, um, you know, um, ideal, that, that that theoretically that works. But these things are all best addressed on a case by case basis. And it, you're you're inviting me to talk about something that's really very powerfully important that has to do and touches on this concept of parental alienation. Um, that the, the idea that one parent poisons the mind of a child vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the other parent in consistent and hostile and unreasonable ways so that the child acts unreasonably doing the bidding of the um, um, promoting parent. And, that bear, and that's not uncommon. It's very controversial because there's, there's no such thing. <laughs> I've argued both sides of this in a court of law. There's no such thing as parental alienation syndrome as far as the profession is concerned. And I'm here to tell you there is such a thing as parental alienation uh, uh, um, reality. And so children can be influenced, of course, depending on their age and, and vulnerabilities, by um, parents according to whatever their... Um, conscious and subconscious agendas may be. And so when it comes to the balance of visitation, the balance of time together, I think the, the trier of fact, the judge wants to start with 50-50 until he or she is persuaded that it ought to be otherwise. And um, that's always case by case, and it's always grounds for um, um, adversarial persuasion in a court of law. Yeah, John, what do you think the, um, in terms of when parents are starting to, to discuss um, custody, wh where, is your, where do you think the, base, the baseline should be? Where should parents start? Should it be starting at like, let's start with 50-50 and see how that plays out? Should we, is it based on people's schedules? Who's got more time? number of children, not number of children, like is that irrelevant? Where do you think the starting point when two people realize the marriage is ending, um, but they, the parenting is important? Are you asking me or you're asking Norman? I'm at, no, I'm sorry, asking Norman, sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry if I said John, apologies. Um, yeah, again, that's case by case and it um, rests on um, the parents' um, degree of wanting to do what's best for the children. The parents know which child in a family um, is best served by um, attention by whichever parent. And I think that if they're not using their children as um, uh, fodder in a custody battle, then it's very common for them to agree upon in very um, um, malleable ways 
to balance that. Maybe some, uh, uh, maybe while the child's in school, it's better off being at, in the home of the parent that's closest to school kind of thing. I think that that's a very individual uh, and uniquely determined thing. Um, I would draw the, a very uh, uh, bold dividing line between parents that, want, that, that are willing to collaborate in the best interest of the child versus parents that are fighting tooth and nail in a custody battle just to defeat the other one. Um, and so um, to the extent that the, the judge always wants to have the parents and their representative attorneys bring to the table as much of the pie that's agreed upon as is possible. Because the judge only has, the judge has no interest in that which is agreed upon. The judge has an interest in adjudicating the, the slice that isn't agreed upon. And so it's always case by case. And if the parents are, are <laughs> if the parents aren't, animals about it then that then that the judge is a small one um the, we get called in when that slice is not so small and that's why i say i bring that stuff home at night well, Norman, does that answer um, your question yes uh, yeah it does go ahead john um yeah there are cases where one parent is the uh, is promoting the Dispute, dispute. The other parent wants to settle. Uh, do you think the court has any ability to discriminate and to rule in the best interest of the child, which is in the interest of the parent that is willing to settle and is, is, is keeping the child's best interest in mind and not using the court to, to um, get at the other parent? There's an element that I haven't touched on that matters a great deal to the judge in family court uh, that pivots on the age of the child. The judge will listen to the child's wishes, will weigh very heavily the child's wishes if that child is an adolescent or uh, uh, just a pre-adolescent. Not so much if the child is young, uh, younger than that, but um, the, the, the judge will defer to the wishes of the child in the judge's decisions when it comes to the nuances of um, what they prefer. Um, absent that, the judge can only go by and on whatever evaluations the court has ordered in terms of parental fitness. And that gets very technical and you know goes back to the clinical evaluation, the psychometric, i.e. testing evaluation, and most importantly and saliently, the naturalistic observation, the, the unobtrusive observation of the expert of the interactions of the child with parent. Those are very important. What about the false accusations that can play out in a courtroom, Norman? Who decides what's false? That's what, right. So if a parent comes in and says, you know, um, I don't want my ex, my soon-to-be ex ha to have um, overnights. I don't want them to have this and that. They start making claims, um, could be wild claims. But someone in your capacity, is that the, some of the things you're, uh, as an evaluator, looking for? If those things are raised during the period during which I am charged with making an evaluation, I explore them. Okay. Uh, if what you're talking about um, uh, touches on abuse, then there, then have there been police reports? Does right. the pediatrician notice any changes? Do the teachers notice any change? That sort of thing. And then ultimately, Colleen, uh, this is not um, physics. This is subjective. And so I just give my best guess and buttress it with the evidence that I have the other side will have their own shrink doing that thing. Um, so the judge is left with the reliability, validity, and credibility of the evidence. And the judge ultimately is going to make a guess. 
That's why you stay away from court unless you have to, because ultimately it's a guess. We have a question here from Steve by chat. And this, what happens when a parent, or, or Steve, do you want to speak up and ask the question yourself? Oh, you're muted right now. Hold on, I'm mute. Hey, okay. Steve. Sorry, how's it going? So oh. my situation, just three and a half years ago, I'm coming back into this. Um, I went to court and we met with family relations. I'm not agreeing to sleepovers. Um, and no custody evaluation was ordered. She disagreed with everything. And we ended up with a temporary custody order that gave me three hours during the week and every other weekend with no sleepovers for, What know. jurisdiction is this? Where is this? This was out of Middletown uh, court. So, I mean, somebody at family relations, why don't they say, say all right, this parent's you, not being, this parent's not being reasonable. We have to order something. Were you represented by counsel? I was represented by a collaborative divorce lawyer. And I didn't know I was in a high conflict situation. I didn't know that my ex-wife had a personality disorder. I didn't know any of this, but you know, I show up there and paying somebody $400 an hour and I walk out with, you know, a traumatic experience. So what's your question? Um, why would a evaluation not be ordered when a parent is being unreasonable? Well, I, I have to, I have to tell you, um, I don't know why the judge, uh, I don't know. Listen, I'm yeah. a psychologist. I cannot give legal advice. However, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time and I know that judges can be capricious sometimes. And that boils down to your, this, this, this attorney you paid $400 an hour to, was this attorney representing only you? Or was he representing the family unit? And who appointed oh. this attorney? Did you hire him? Who is yeah, this I, I, client? I hired a, a female attorney out of West Hartford. And you, were, she, you were her sole, her sole client? Yep. My well, your redress, your redress is only through her. Whatever outcome yep. that is, um, you need to find out uh, the explanation from her. And if she didn't do her job, and I know this is ugly and, and um, 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 not helpful, but if, if she was negligent in doing her job, um, that's actionable. Um, I don't know the facts of the case. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you at length if you want to call me and yeah. I could explore. Norman, no, it's okay. I mean, I, I went back. I got a high conflict lawyer. I have a 50-50 plan now, but it took three and a half years. Oh, well, you know? so and I, me and my daughter were traumatized and now, you know. Exactly. It just exactly. shouldn't happen. This is the ugliest shit ever, and the trauma to the children are, is long-lasting. Well, could I, could I step in here? Because I think Steve is saying, why didn't the court recognize that the court was being used by the wife to, um, to retaliate against the husband? The, 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 uh, yeah, she the used her as dad. a pawn all the time. It's not uncommon for the trier of fact, the judge, to be persuaded one way or another. Now, we don't know in each individual case how fair-minded the judge is, how biased the judge we, is, how tired we never, the judge is. Sorry, we, we never got in front of a judge. We didn't get in front of a judge. They, so who, so who? they strongly encouraged me to sign a temporary custody agreement that was not in the best interest of our daughter. And, you know, I don't know. I'm paying somebody pretty good money. I figure they've you know, she retired last year. I figure she must be experienced. I mean, that it just shouldn't happen. That's all. So you're saying life isn't fair? Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, yeah. This is ugly business. It's ugly business. And I'm glad just, you, I mean, you're talking about the 50-50. I'm just wondering, prior to getting to you, can it be 50-50 right from the beginning? When two parents, they're they're divorced. They're in separate if houses. They agree. Yes. It, they agree. Well, they disagree. They disagree, but the child deserves to have a relationship. Pauline, with both you parents. work with this. You, yeah. you you're no, I mean, listen, that's part of the, about this balance. Right. 
that's what shared parenting is. I mean, that's what we stand for, trying to get those laws changed. So Steve, so sorry what you, what you went through. I'm glad you had a good outcome, but you shouldn't have had to go through three years. It should be 50-50 right from the get-go. And then the parents can decide if that's something that works for that family unit, but you shouldn't have to fight for the 50-50. And I agree with you, Steve, that you know when, when you're presented with um, butting up against your ex-wife where she wasn't being reasonable, that the courts can intervene and say, it's 50-50 until we figure the rest of this out and they could, then could order somebody such as Dr. Klein to do an investigation or a guardian ad litem. But you are so right. The, the unfortunate part is it doesn't work that way. Um, family services aren't trained appropriately in that way. And we need more people like you, yourself on shared parenting to, you know, to help other people in the future not have to go through what you and your daughter went through. You know, that's a yeah. great point. Um, I, wonder, I wonder whether or not yeah. there are online support groups, because what you're describing, Steve, is common. And I wonder yeah. if, you, if there's a way to pool and cross-fertilize people's experience so that everybody can be brought up to speed without having to go through um, the, 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 the um, um, uglinesses. Um, you, that's a great uh, um, idea. You know, this yeah, it's just tough. I mean, I, I just, it comes down to family relations. You get to court, you get this entitled person that's coming at you trying to annihilate the other parent and they, you got to recognize it, and it's disagreeable. Right. They have a warfare, right. disagreeable personality. They're just and it's an intimidate. It's an intimidating environment to even yeah. be. In. I mean, so you make some very, very good points, and appreciate your contribution for sure. Does anybody mm -hmm. else have any any questions for Dr. Klein? You can type it in on the side, or you can. Um, why don't I raise your hand? Why don't I? Uh, mention how you can reach me and if it yep. occurs to you you can be in touch with me uh, what well, i'll give you my website that's every way to reach me so it's norman klein phd uh, dot com and klein is k-l-e-i-n and if you have any lingering questions i'm happy at, put no, it in the chat. at no fee to um give whatever opinion and guidance i can Thank you, Norman. Really appreciate that contribution. There's a lot of people out there who actually need that. You'll find his, uh, if you missed it, it's normankleinphd.com. I put it in the chat box. You can oh. grab it off of there. Okay. Thank you. Well, so appreciate it, Norman, coming on. And I'm sure we're going to have you back again, um, either to continue on in this vein or other areas of divorce that we need to spend some time It was on. my pleasure. Thank you. And nice to meet you, good people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Norman, thanks. Excellent. Bye, Kalina. See Bye. You. Thank you. I'll see Bye. you in the office. Yeah. <laughs>